Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, I knew the Episcopals would show up late. Where's mom and dad? <laughs> now, my name is Bob Tarter. I'm with Animology. If you have ever seen me give a wildlife program before, raise your hand, please. Good. We like repeats. Hands down. If you have ever seen me give a wildlife program, you know we're going to have a good time. You don't believe me? You can ask me. I'll tell you all about it. Now, whenever we have a wildlife program, it doesn't matter how many people we have. We always have three easy rules. And for those of you that are old enough and know me long enough, I have now owned and operated my company for over 20 years. Before the virus, I would travel over 10 states. I'd visit roughly 350 schools during the school year. During the summer, I couldn't get to all the venues that wanted me, and we hire other programmers. It's usually teachers on break. You can make more money with me than you can teaching. Sorry, I'm sure they get paid like dirt, not my fault. Now, whenever we have a program, it doesn't matter how many people we have. We have three easy rules. In 2016, I set two personal records. One was the highest attended program I've ever conducted. The Clarksville, Tennessee Public Library on the inaugural Harry Potter Reading Day had me do a Care of Magical Creatures program. I exhibited animals for the books and the movies. 1,487 people showed up for that program. I did not charge nearly enough for that one. They want me back and want $3 a head. Actually, with diesel now, I want 5 That same year, we had the lowest attended program at the Luxora, Arkansas Public Library. Three people showed up, and two were the librarians working. They've now closed that branch, so we want to make sure we enjoy our library. So turn your brains on, mouths closed, ears open. These animals know how to act as long as you follow the rules. Rule one, bottoms all the way on the floor, sitting crisscross, applesauce, hands your laps. If you can see my hands, you'll see these animals. Do not worry. I drink a lot of tea. I'm going to be trying to walk around so everybody can see. If your hand or your foot in the aisle and I step on it, it's not going to feel good. I'm a big fat guy. Be careful it starts in your 30s, son. So rule one, stay seated, stay quiet. Rule two, do you think I brought anything interesting with me? Yes. yes. That's why you're here. That's why you're going to have those questions. Questions are great. Questions are how we learn. Rule two states, we save our questions for the end of the program. We go over them as a group. Rule two is everyone's favorite because rule two means you get to hang out longer with me. So save your questions. Rule three, I want to see how smart you all are. I'll be asking you questions. If you have an answer to one of my questions, I want you to raise your hand. We do not holler at these answers. We don't want to scare these animals. My friends, these are three simple, easy rules. Stay seated, stay quiet, save your questions. If you have an answer to one mind, you can raise your hand. Everyone who wants to stay here, see the animals, and follow my three rules, raise your hand, please. Good. Yes, sir. Does anybody want to break the rules, make me upset, have to go outside and start picking up trash? Bummer. I'm trying to find you all a litter crew. Now, parents, please feel free to take as many pictures you like during my program. But this is now time to silence and vibrate your phone. If your phone goes off while I'm talking, you will be volunteer for stuff you do not want to be a part of. Three weeks ago, we were in Madison, Alabama, and a mean mom had her phone go off during the program. She had to kiss one of the animals to learn the lesson. You can post pictures of me and my animals on whatever social media page you choose to. We just do ask you to be aware who is in the background of these photos. Some parents do not want their child on your social media page. Conversely, you're a guest of our public library. They're going to be taking pictures of you. You can become famous. They're going to put you on all kinds of social marketing. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, newspapers, petroglyphs, smoke signals. If you do not want this, tough, deal with it. I'm tired of people complaining about the way their hair looks on Facebook nowadays. Now, if one of the little ones is not enjoying the content of the program, parents, please feel free to pick up, walk around the library, stay in the air community, you can take them outside if you want. But at the conclusion of the program, you must come back and pick up your other ones. I don't need any of yours taken away from everybody else's. You're laughing, it happens. Five years ago, I was in Lexington, Kentucky, and a mother left me four children under the age of five for 20 minutes at the end of the program because she wanted to go pick out her books. Friends, I grew up on a dairy farm. You are livestock to me. I took one of my animals out of the kennel, threw all hers in one. By that point in time, I was fine. She's lucky I didn't hear tag them in vet check. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and get started. These animals know how to act when you act properly. What's special about today is these are creatures that want to be asleep right now, but will be awake and active at nighttime. Who can tell me by raising hand? What do we call it when an animal sleeps during the day? Go. That is an example. That's not what we call it. Sleeping during the day. Very good. Nocturnal. So if I get out nocturnal animals, do you think you need to act properly? Yeah. Parents, have you noticed this phenomenon? I have an 11-year-old son and a 7-year-old daughter. Every day during the school year, I have to wake them up to get them to go to school. 
on summer break and Christmas break, their little bottoms are up at oh dark 30. I don't understand that. Ah, we're going to get out our first animal. And she has what I call the O factor. Meaning whenever I get out, students, parents, grandparents, weird librarians that are in top off the squidgy hat, have a tendency to make these oh noises. I hate them. So, catch a bubble in your mouth. One finger on your lip, the other hand on your hip. These animals know how to act as long as you act properly for them. This first one is a very special little girl. And this one here, I want you all to meet Charlie. Well, those bubbles. Say hi, Charlie. Hi, Charlie. Who can raise your hand and identify? What are we looking at? What is this, huh? You know what it is? Hedgehog. Very good. This is a hedgehog. This is actually the African pygmy hedgehog. Now, what's special about this animal is this is a very good one for you to learn new terms. Open your ears. Next new word, niche. Say it, please. Niche. Niche is an animal's job. It's what they do in the wild. And this little animal here has a great niche for you. Now, when you look at her, these hairs here on the back, these are not like the quills of a porcupine. The quill of a porcupine is designed to come out of their body and stick in the ears. Where these hairs here stay in her body until we pull them out and it hurts. But if she gets scared or nervous, she'll curl into that little bitty ball. The problem is, Charlie here is a lot like me, and we are very sociable animals. During the quarantine, we didn't do very well. I'm basically a Labrador. I've never met a stranger. Now, this animal here is going to want to eat other animals. Does it look like she's going to be able to run down and eat something like a deer or a rabbit? No. She has to eat things she can catch, which will be bugs. Beetles, snails, slugs, and grubs. The bigger, the juicier, the slimier, the better. If you eat a diet of only bugs, open ears, next new word, insectivore. Say it, please. Insectivore. Now, when we look at the way she's built, that niche, that job, she has that long nose that is always smelling. Bright eyes to see well for a nocturnal animal. Large ears, but do not look past these whiskers. Humans do not think of our sensation of touch until we become visually impaired. Animals use it a lot more often than us. You can have a domesticated cat living in your home that'll be completely blind, and you'll never know. Cats will memorize the layout of the furniture in your home using their whiskers. They walk around touching it the entire time. You don't know you have a blind cat until you move the furniture around. <coughs> There's a Helen Keller joke in her somewhere. Now, what we have to understand is this is actually a product of the Roman Empire. Hedgehogs are naturally found living all throughout Europe, Asia, and Africa. There's an African species of hedgehog that gets the size of a basketball. Now, Charlie came to live with me at the beginning of the summer. She's on loan from a friend of ours, and Charlie was a little heavy when she came. I tried to explain to the parents, you don't have to feed an animal everything they want. So we put her on a diet. She's doing very well. We've given her an exercise ball, so she does very well now. When she came to me, she was the size of a softball. That's a little too heavy for her. Now, the belly hair here, this is where she does her yoga during the program. That's called upside down relaxing dog. This is what I look like when I try and do sit ups now, so be careful. Now, these animals here, the Romans use it as a multi use creature. The hair here on the back was used to make everything from cardstock to animal training, but the army always marches on their stomach. The hedgehog would be daily rations of a Roman foot soldier. Take your hedgehog, throw it in the fire when the hair was burned off, dinner was done. Now, you may not want to be eating something this cute, but that's better than eating a pile of bugs, don't you think? Yeah. Now, the other important thing to learn on Charlie here, she was a good one that we used in the Tails and Tails program last year. You see her little bitty tail? You know what that little tail helps her do? Poop. Everything has to poop, and you have to realize that. Now, nowadays, hedgehogs are used basically just as pets. The wild ones all throughout Europe, Asia, and Africa, we're starting to see that their numbers are declining. This is what we call a sight indicator. This is an animal that gives us a clue of the world around us. Overuse of pesticides, habitat fragmentation, degradation laws. We do not have the number of hedgehogs we should. Come on up, buddy. Sit right next to Miss Rachel. You'll be fine. Now, this animal here is 18 months old. Before the virus, I had what was called the Learnable Program. That's why I have extra animals in my collection that can go live with a school, a homeschool group, or even a library. I think we need a library pet. Now what you have to understand is I gotta get one of my male hedgehogs back from a teacher up in Illinois. The teacher in his class named the male hedgehog Don Prickles. The same guy's got a pop belly pig named Kevin Bacon. <laughs> Come on, these are the jokes parents work with me. <laughs> now for those of you who don't know, I am licensed and permitted through the state and federal government. With that, I have to follow their rules. 
which means I have to put stickers on my boxes reminding me that they have live animals and which way is up. We love government oversight, don't we? Now, Charlie here will walk around during the rest of the program. She's probably going to fall asleep in the corner. Because remember, as a nocturnal lamp. You all heard that warning, did you not? Wow, we're going to have to make an example of this employee. Yeah, get the five punches in there. Oh, I got something better. That's way too cute. Now, we're going to get out the next ammo. The next one is, again, one with the old finger. So bottoms down, sitting proper, catch your bubbles. One finger on your lip, the other hand on your hip. This one is certainly a cool one and possibly one that needs a little smooch today. This one I want you all to meet. Buddy. Catch your bubbles. Say hi, buddy. When we look at Buddy here, we are looking at the California King Snake. All the way on your body said you don't want to block anybody. Now, we're going to start off at the basics. I want to see how bright you all are. Some of you know me from Mount Pleasant Elementary at Career Day. Some of you know me from Agathos. So this should be review. Who can tell me by raising their hand, what is the main... You don't know the question yet. Hands down. <laughs> What's the main difference between a snake and a lizard? What do lizards have that snakes don't? Very good, honey. She's seen me before. The difference between snakes and lizards has nothing to do with legs. We have legless lizards that live right here in Tennessee. The difference comes down to two of them. We're going to use our friends right here in the front row in an experiment. Because if I kill some of you, it's not that big of a deal. Parents are always making us new ones. Seriously, have you seen the babies that are showing up? I'm not worried about running out of clients. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to do an observational experiment. Watch, dude. I'm going to take my finger and I'm going to touch his eyeball. Can he blink? No. I take my finger and I poke your eye. Can you blink? Yeah. Snakes do not have eyelids. Lizards do. That is the first of two differences. The second difference is important for anybody that's a little snake phobic. Eyes on me. I can get as loud as I would. Does Buddy freak out? No. That's because snakes do not have ears. So if you see a snake on the ground and you don't want to get closer to it, you start screaming and hollering. Is that going to do any good? No. They can't hear you. If you see a snake on the ground, you don't want to get close to it. The best thing you can do is actually stomp your feet. The ground vibrations will be felt by the belly scales. And on Buddy here, I think they look just like Legos, don't they? Does any parent hurt looking at those Legos right now from stepping on something like that? I hear it's like right below childbirth. Now, what we have to understand is this animal here has no eyelids, nor does he have ears. But the entire time we've had him out, he's been sticking out that tongue, you see? Why does he stick out his tongue? What is he doing? That's one where the books have it wrong. Think of this. You see with your eyes. You hear with your ears. You smell with your nose. You touch with your skin. What do we use our tongue for? What sense? Taste. He's tasting the air. Try this for an experiment. Underneath the black tablecloth, I have a surprise for you. Stick your tongue out at it. Can you taste the chocolate chip cookies I brought for you? No, it's a joke. I didn't bring any. You don't get a cookie. But these animals here will take that tongue, flick it through the air. They then pull that scent-laden particle tongue to the inside of their body. Once it's on the inside of the body, there's a hole on the roof of the mouth called the Jacobson's organ. They stick their tongue right in there. It's right below the brain. Now, people always ask me, Mr. Bob, why is the California king snake striped like this? We know each other. We're fine. Now, what we have to think of here is this animal, the king snake, has this colored pattern because God had made it this way. But I assume it's going to give him the wonderful mimicry that we can see with our zebras. Use it. You're fine. Breathe. I'll tell you when to panic. The boxes are getting bigger. What's your heart rate at right now? You're kind of freaking me out right now. Yeah. Now, what we have to think of. These animals are so important. Not only do snakes eat mice, moles, voles, and rats, second leading cause of structural fires here in Tennessee, as well as 5% of the food produced worldwide is damaged by rodents. But king snakes eat other snakes, including venomous ones. This is another one where the books have it wrong. There is no such thing as a poisonous snake. Poison is when you eat something bad. Venom is when it's injected in your body. There's no such thing as a poisonous snake. You can eat them. I have. That offended a vegan last summer during the program. I don't care. Now, what we have to understand, the only way you can identify a venomous snake here in this part of North America. Friends, do an experiment. Look at your neighbor's eyes. 
What do we call the center part of the eye? Raise your hand. What do we call it? The pupil. What is the shape of your neighbor's pupil? What shape do we call it? Circle. Very good. Thank you for not saying round. Round's not really a shape. When we look at Buddy here, dude, does he have a circle pupil like ours? I can get closer. <laughs> Say yes. Yes. He has a circle pupil like ours. If you are here in North America and you're worried about a snake being venomous, the only way you can tell is to look at the pupil. If it is circle like ours, you're looking at a non-venomous snake. If you look at a snake and the pupil is an oval, looks like a football, you're looking at a venomous snake. I know what you're thinking. You're looking at me going, Bob, whenever I see a snake, I don't get close enough to look yeah. at the pupil. I get as close as the garden hoe gets. You actually peg me more as a shotgun type. <laughs> now, snakes, venomous or not, all they want to do is help us out by eating rodents. North American wildlife that causes most human fatalities, bees. Bees, wasps, and hornets. If you get stung, you go on anaphylactic shock, you don't have an EpiPen, you're dead before EMS can even show up. Number two, wildlife that causes most human fatalities, deer. Now, are deer running down, attacking, killing, and eating people? No, fortunately not. That'd be kind of cool. Now, what you have to understand is you hit them with your car, you have your human fatality from there. But you have to think about this. We talk statistics. More people die every year moving domesticated cattle. Sorry to pick on you, but you guys are my profile. It's usually older men that have spent their entire lives around them. You don't hear very well anymore. Huh? You don't move very well anymore. And people die every day moving cattle and horses more than all wildlife combined. Now, this snake right here is over 22 years old right now. Now, when we think about what he eats, he eats only other animals. Meat eaters, good. Who can give me that better term? What do we call that consumer? Go, son. Very good. This is a carnivore. Now, these guys here, this is a very good programming animal. Like, I could seriously throw it on you. It'd be fine. But he has also been doing this for decades. He's very calm and relaxed. Should you try and pick up a snake in the wild and handle it like this? No. You'll get bit. Because anything that gets scared will protect themselves. Now, buddy here will actually shed the skin soon. Probably in the next two days. He will even shed the skin off of his eyeball. Now, as yesterday when we were doing programs, he had a cloudy color to his eye because the skin is getting ready to pop off. And today, he's not using that sensation of taste as much to see if there's a predator or a food. Now, we're going to go ahead and we're going to put him up and get out our next animal. Water break number three. I don't know if any of you got the virus, and I think I got it back in January, but you can't have the virus if you don't take a test. But since then, my voice hasn't been as strong as it used to be. Now, if we can get out the next one, friends. This is a very nocturnal animal, and this is the one that thinks he's the baby this year. If I get out an animal thinks he's a baby, you need to act properly. Now, so make sure your bottom's all the way down. Sitting crisscross. Hold that bubble. Still as a stone. He's already still asleep in there. I have to wake him up. You don't like when people wake you up to go to school, do you? No. So all the way on your bottoms. Hold those bubbles. If you haven't answered one of mine, you can raise your hand. Hey, come on. You gotta go to work. Dude, I do all the talking and all the driving. All you gotta do is the cute one. I'd like you all to meet Bradley. Say hi, Bradley. Hi, Bradley. We left Cooper at home today. Come on, Bradley Cooper, that's a good joke. <laughs> Who can identify Bradley? What's standing on my shoulders? What is this? Raccoon. It's a raccoon. Raise your hand next time. Raccoon, I also accept trash panda as a correct answer. <laughs> now this animal here, look at the way he's built, his niche, his job. This one here is going to be the same consumer we are. Friends, raise your hand if you like to eat hamburgers and hot dogs. Good. Raise your hand if we should be eating fruits and vegetables. Good. This animal right here is going to be the same consumer we are, eating both plant material and meat. What do we call that when an animal does that? Go. No. Go. Very good. Omnivore. It's one for Agathos. We like that post. Now, what we have to think about here. Bradley, when he was born alive, because he is a mammal, his eyes and ears were still closed. This animal doesn't remember his biological mother. He thinks I'm his mom. When he came to me, his eyes and ears were closed. Now, as much as I tried, I could not lactate for this animal, so I had to feed him from a bottle. 
So he doesn't remember his biological mother. He thinks I'm his mom. Now, he has a long nose. Give him a good sense of smell. You're still not freaking. You're doing great. He has good eyes. Notice how the ears are higher on his head. That's going to help him hear things. Because even at this size, he's worried about somebody trying to eat him. So his ears and eyes will help him find predators. He finds his food by his sense of smell and this sensation of touch. These are hands. These are not paws. The raccoon uses their hands to feel and find their way to find that food. The raccoon washes their hands not because they want to be clean animals. Trash panda. Raccoons wash their hands to be able to have a better sensation of touch. Raccoons also wash their food because they do not have saliva glands like we do. So they have to pre-wash their food to be able to swallow it. Now, friends, I was born in the 70s. I grew up in the 80s. We didn't have snowflakes then. But what you have to understand, I don't know if it's pronounced GIF or GIF, but has anybody seen the one where they give a raccoon cotton candy and he takes it to his water bowl and he washes it and it all disappears? And then he looks up just like a child that lost a balloon. Really, it's sad. Now, these animals here, in the wild, once their eyes and ears open up at about five weeks of age, mom will take her babies out to teach them how to find food and scavenge for that omnivorous lifestyle. Now, when mom starts weaning her babies, they'll start eating their own food. But then they turn into teenagers, and they start whining and complaining, going, I'm starving, I'm hungry. And mom cannot feed them milk anymore. So what is she going to do? She regurgitates food, meaning she vomits in her mouth and the babies eat it. Now, as odd as you think I am, I have never done it before. <laughs> Now, you may find that gross and disgusting. Definitely you, ma'am. You have to understand, though. I've never gotten a cold or a germ from one of my animals. When yours touch me, I'm in a hazmat suit. Seriously. Friends, look to your left. Look to your right. That is the most diseased, germ-covered wildlife you'll ever come in contact with. 19 of you have been picking your nose while I've been talking. 17 of the 19 ate it, so we're going to be honest here. I'm not looking at them, but these are disease germ-covered wildlife. Ma'am, wash your hands before you eat anything. Seriously, those things are covered in germs. Now, the raccoon is a very important mammal for us. This is our state mammal, and this is an important creature for us because we wouldn't have been able to settle this. Because our raccoon is a fur bearer. They bear this fur coat. Without this fur coat, we would have never been able to settle here. Now, as smart and as intelligent as he is, and cute right now, would this animal make an ideal pet for you? No. No! He's lying. He's not this cute. We're actually on the fourth version of kennel with him because it takes him nine months to figure out how to open the door. The first year I did this, I was living in Midtown Memphis. I was doing a nocturnal lineup that year, and I had to be in Huntsville, Alabama by 8.30. So when I loaded up, it was still dark. As the sun came up over the horizon, right outside by the rockets, I looked in the rear view mirror. In the bed of my pickup truck, the raccoon had opened his cage, the bobcat cage, and the fox cage, and they're all running around inside the bed of the pickup truck. If you ever see a biologist like me and we have zip strips, we are not going to kidnap you. We don't want any more of you. We use them to keep our animals contained. Now, you can legally have raccoons and foxes as pets now in the state of Tennessee. Ask me if this is a good idea. No. The first year they did this, TWRA issued over 332 permits. By year one, when it came time for everybody to renew, 30 did. 300% decrease. Those animals died, escaped, or then got bought and sold and traded illegally. I have one fox in my collection right now that I refer to as one of my children. It didn't cost me anything to make it. It showed up. I'm feeding it, housing it, training it. I can't make money off of it. It's part of a court case right now with TWRA. No, you don't need to get up on the table. <laughs> but soon she will be in our lineup for our other nocturnal animals as well as our ecosystem program. Now our raccoons are very, very intelligent. That good brain and those good hands. Should you be feeding these animals? No. There's enough food in the wild for them to be able to eat and do well without your assistance. If you feed them, they grow too accustomed to being around mankind, and then we start having problems with them getting into your house and making damage. Kennel. Now, we're going to get out the next exhibit. 
And this one is important. Mr. Bob has to wear a glove. Again, if I'm wearing a glove, that means I can get hurt. I don't want to get hurt. On your bottoms, hold that bubble. This is Jake to see something very cool, <laughs> up close and personal, that you're probably not going to be able to see again. I'd like you all to meet Billy. Say hi, Billy. Hi, Billy. Now hold your bubble. Who can raise your hand and identify? What are we looking at? A bat. Now is Billy a bat? This is a mega bat. Mega means big, micro means small. Even though he doesn't look like it right now, this guy here has an almost two foot wingspan. That's why we call them mega. Now this bat here eats things you like to eat. That's not true of every bat. Raise your hand if you like to eat bananas. Raise your hand if you like to eat watermelon. Raise your hand if you like to eat pineapple. Raise your hand if you like the more exotic fruits, papayas, mangoes, figs, dates, patrick, guava, good hands down. Our 21 and over crowd. Raise your hand if you like margaritas. Raise your hand if you can use one right now. You see something wrong with that joke? I'm sorry. I was raised Catholic. Now, everything we're talking about is made possible because of our fruit bat. And when we look at him, I think he looks like a werewolf like this. Looks like an upside down chihuahua when I do this. Now this animal here eats only plant tissue. Plant eaters good. Who can give me that better word? What do we call it? Go, hun. No, go. Herbivore. Remember, herbivores are consumers that eat only plant tissue. Vegetarian and vegans are confused people that personally I don't think are eating properly and I've never met one I really like. But this animal right here is our herbivore. He has that large nose, giving him that good sense of smell. He has those bright eyes to see well at nighttime. See how his ears are constantly moving though, constantly listening? Bats are very sociable creatures and they like to be around their own kind. If he finds a tree full of fruit, he'll make happy noises and that will alert all the other bats in the area that there's food there. Now, the bat is the most numerous type of mammal. We have more bat species on the planet than we have of anything else. But we have to go over four characteristics that will be a defining feature that mammals have. Give me them. Give me one characteristic of a mammal. Very good. Take two fingers. Touch your skin. Are you warm or cold? Warm? I'm already wet today, people. I'm sorry. I'm fat. Mammals are warm-blooded. Now, whenever we get hot, we sweat. Now, I know ladies don't sweat, but you glow, glisten, spritz, sparkle, shimmer, and shine. Some of you can do it all at the same time. That started during Dr. Seuss week. I got one more in line. See, that's the best joke in the entire program. The librarians didn't even laugh. Our mammal here will pant to radiate body heat like a dog, but he is warm to the touch. What's another characteristic of a mammal? No. Very good, library. If you didn't hatch out of an egg, did your mother cut off a thumb and you grow from that? No. You all were born alive, but when you're born alive, you'd be a lot cuter to me than you are now. You know what? Babies don't talk back. This animal here was born alive over 12 years ago in a captive breeding program in New Jersey. He's much happier being a southern gentleman like me now. So live birth, warm blood. What's another characteristic? Go. Very good. Mammals have to have hair or fur. Look at me and the other dads. Do we always have to have our hair? Nope. I don't care. I'm married. I'm giving up. I haven't paid for a haircut in over 18 years. Mammals have to have that hair or fur. What's our last characteristic? Grandma, you're fine. Chill out. Why do we feed babies? Before we feed them baby food, what do we feed babies? Milk. When you were a baby, before you ate baby food, you drank milk from your mom. Deal with that. Billy here drank milk from his mom before he came to live with me. Before he was old enough, mature enough to come live with me as our herbivore, eating only that plant tissue. Now, if you could feel between his shoulder blades, oh, that's a library phone, they're in trouble. <laughs> this guy here, his resting heart rate is over 150 beats per minute. He's not scared, he's not nervous, he's done this for over a decade. But what you have to think about is these animals here have to eat a lot of food. Bats have to eat two to two and a half times their body weight in food every night. So think about this. If I was a consumer like Billy, I'd have to eat 500 pounds of food in one night. If I eat 500 pounds of watermelon or banana, do you think I'll be going to the bathroom a lot? Yeah. 
The term used to describe the droppings of the bat. Open your ears. Next new word. Guano. Say it, please. Guano. You like guano and you don't even know it. Come on, Mimo. This animal here eats nothing but fruit, flies around at nighttime, and when he goes to the bathroom, the guano will be full of seeds. These animals are responsible for pollinating and distributing seeds for over 2,500 different plant species. A lot of the fruit nut production rainforest is made possible by our bats. Let's not forget the plant we get tequila from is pollinated by a bat, not a bee. That's why that margarita joke works while we're educating today's youth, and Bob's been self-medicating since March of 2020. Now, what we have to understand, our bats here in Tennessee, are they going to look like Billy here? No. We have micro bats. Our bats only have a wingspan of about five to eight inches. But what do our bats eat here in Tennessee? What are our bats eating? No, you got to ask, what about our bats here? They're going to be the same consumer as Sleepy Charlie, eating only bugs. Insectivore. Say it again. Insectivore. Now, our insectivore is not going to be able to look like that herbivore. You're not going to have that big nose. You're not going to have those big eyes. But they have actually bigger ears. How do our bats use their ears to find their food in their way in complete darkness? Go, hun. Very good. Echolocation. Listen. Our bats will let out a loud, high-frequency sound wave, and when the echo comes back to them, in their mind's eye, they can see a three-dimensional picture of the world around us. Our bats have such good hearing, they can see a single strand of human hair floating over the audience. Now, does a mosquito weigh very much, though? No. With that, our bats have to eat that much more food. During the summer, our bats will eat 2,000 to 3,000 mosquitoes almost any given summer night. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Good thing. They can eat more. What is the obesity epidemic in the state? I mean, they could beat you up here. Now, during the winter, listen. Dude, we talked about this. You're not allowed to fly to the ceiling. They don't have a tall enough ladder. Wait. Now, during the winter, do we have enough bugs flying around? No. So when an animal is faced with a food shortage, there's one of two things they can do. Friends, what do we call it when you pick up from one location and you move someplace else? Go. Migration. Some of our bats will migrate. Think about this. Late summer, early fall. They fly all the way down to Central and South America. We could be on the beach in Belize right now. Instead, we're in Mount Pleasant, Tennessee at this exact moment. Woo! Now, during the winter, some of them will sleep during the season. What do we call when an animal sleeps during the season? Hibernation. When our bats get ready to hibernate, they gorge themselves on food. They will eat up to 5,000 mosquitoes a night. They put fat on their body. Then they go find a building or a cave, and they slow down. Heart rate, metabolic rate, digestion rate. The guano will still pile up on the floor. We mine this guano. We extract this guano. We use it in everyday lives. It's here with us now. Ladies, bat your eyelashes. Active ingredient in your mascara is guano. Ma'am, you have bat poop by your eyeballs, what I'm telling you. <laughs> you need to touch up. There's a fresh pile if you need to, okay? Pluck of those lips, lip gloss, lipstick. The reason that catches the light, that is actually ground up fish scales. The powder on your face so you do not shine is beetle carcasses. That's how they get the different skin tones. Very expensive perfume has whale vomit in it. Now, I don't know why I know this, but knowledge is power. But I gotta get on my soapbox here for a second. Something happened last summer at a library in West Tennessee that has never happened to me before. During one of my programs, I offended somebody. Here's the thing, I know God put me here on the planet to teach children and adults about animals. And I talk fact, not fiction. Facts are not wrong, they're facts. So if my facts offend you, I'm sorry, I don't care. <laughs> I got a handwritten note by a parent last year because she was offended by the facts that I teach children. I am very concerned of what the virus has done for our children, so I will push as much vocabulary and facts as I can. And this bothers you. I'm sorry. Shut up. Seriously. I'm very, very concerned about this. A good friend of mine is a speech pathologist in northern Mississippi. He was at the Tunica Library two weeks ago. And he and I were discussing what we're seeing with children now. Because of some of these children with teachers behind masks or on a screen for two years, they do not know how to articulate words. So that's where I want you to understand. I push it as hard as I can. You can send me an angry email. I married my attorney. Sue me. Now, we're going to get out the last exhibit. 
The last exhibit is the one that is very hangry today. So I need your help. Boys, hands to ourselves, sitting crisscross, you need to be as still as a stone. Because if you're moving with this next animal, she'll eat you. She's very hangry today. So catch those bubbles, hold it in there. Save those questions. You have an answer to mine. You can raise your hand. With this exhibit here, Mr. Bob again has to wear gloves. If I'm wearing a glove, that means I can get hurt. I don't want to get hurt. Save those questions. Your answers to mine. You can give it to me by raising your hand. All right. Up. Now, I would like you all to meet L. Say hi, L. Hi, L. Is anybody else a Stranger Things fan? Me, 11. I'm really waiting for her to look at a kid and have their head explode sometime. <laughs> this is our Eurasian Eagle Owl. This is the largest owl species on the planet. Very similar to our Great Horned Owl. Same genus, different species. That's where I want you to understand that term niche. If you understand how to look at an animal and theorize a niche, you can travel to a foreign country and find the animal filling the same job. Now this is my biggest bird. When people look at her, they think I'm stronger than what I really am, and she's heavier. Weight is the enemy of a flying creature. This is my biggest bird. Most people think anywhere from 15 to 30 pounds. I don't want to carry that much weight, neither does she. This is my biggest bird, and she only weighs eight pounds. Birds are nothing but feathers. I'm not even touching skin yet. But for an eight pound animal, does she have large eyeballs? They're huge, they're bigger than mine. And I weigh over 200 pounds now. Thank you, COVID. It wasn't a quarantine 15, it was a 23. I got back into cooking again. Anybody needs it, I got a good, really good recipe for white tail shank or oso buco. You pair it with fingerling heirloom potatoes, butternut squash, roasted in duck fat. The duck fat's where it's at. I know, you can eat the baby in a minute. Now, this is my biggest bird right here. She only weighs eight pounds, but she has these huge eyeballs. If you had owl-sized eyeballs in your head, you would have dodgeball-sized eyeballs. And if you had dodgeball-sized eyeballs in your head, you'd look even funnier. Now, friends, hold your head still. Look up to the ceiling, down the floor. Look left, look right. You can move your eyes up, down, left, and right because we have six muscles to do so. Listen, ladies, when you look at Elle, her eyes will never move. There are no muscles to move those eyes. If you had dodgeball-sized eyeballs in your head and the muscles to move them, your head would be so big and heavy it couldn't stay in your neck and fall off your neck and be behind your shoulder. So the owl's eyes will never move. Instead, does the owl have a flexible neck? Yes. Can an owl spin their head all the way around? No, it pop off. You don't believe me? Try it on a chicken. Where do think chicken nuggets come from? Soy means nowadays. The vegan hated that joke. I would have got a smile out of Sam. Now, what you got to understand is all mammals have seven vertebrae in their neck. Doesn't matter if you're looking at the blue whale, the hippopotamus, or the giraffe. This bird, however, has 14. She can stare in your soul, judging you as a person right now. She says you need more Jesus. Or is it? I don't know which one. Now, her eyes will never move, but instead, with 14 vertebrae in her neck, she can rotate her head 210 degrees each way. They do not spin it all the way around and pop off. Now, owls have amazing nocturnal vision. If you had owl's eyes in the middle of the night, you can see better than you can right now, without starlight, without street lights. Owls find their food, though, by their sense of hearing. I've seen owls survive in the wild with only one functioning eye. Owls find their food just by hearing. Now, your ears are these big fleshy things on the side of your head. You're hearing my voice, the air conditioning, not keeping up with the 95 people we have here right now. Her feathers here, these are just feathers that make her look more fierce. And on a male, they'll be twice that size. Females look for bigger things on the male. Her ears are the little crescent shape on the sides of the eyes. All you can see is that shape right there. She has one ear hole high and one ear hole low by that flesh tearing beak. You ever watch an owl? Sometimes they do that little like head bop dance, right? What they're doing is they're listening to a single spot. These are like satellite dishes. They can be tuned and focused. And she will sit still in the darkness of night listening for food. She can hear something like a mouse breathe at over 100 yards. Using the animal adaptation of mimicry, she blends into the background with camouflage. And she waits to find food. As soon as it makes a mistake and breaks cover, she flies under full power through the darkness of night all the way towards the prey. 
grabs a hold of it with these huge talons, and the prey has no idea what's happening until it's too late, because the owl's wings make no noise. Can you feel the wind? Yeah. Do you hear any sound, though? Not from her. The owl's wings make no noise during flight. I know. Eat the baby in a minute. Now, this animal here, this one came from a captive breeding program in Oregon. When she came to me, she was just 14 days old. She had these soul-piercing eyes, this flesh-tearing beak, covered in these white downy feathers. Like every female in my life, all I did was feed her to try and keep her happy. But you can see, this is not the same relationship that I have with that bottle baby raccoon. I know, you can eat the baby in a second, just wait. Now, she has great vision, even better hearing. What about her sense of smell? Does she have one? No. And with that, one of our owl's favorite things to eat, skunks. Because if you can't smell them, a skunk's a very common, kind of dumb, black and white animal that nobody else eats at nighttime. Now this one here, hatched out in 2018. And she is basically a teenager right now. She has horrible posture. She's slouching right now. Owls have extremely long legs. She will have the talons in the spray these feet here can do over 500 PSI. She'll have the talons in the prey, and the body will be back over 20 inches protecting her. You can also see how she has an extra set of eyelids. See? She has an extra set of eyelid that protects her eyes when she's flying through the brush or if something's trying to attack her. Now, this animal here, there's two reasons why we're not going to fly around in the program. Right now, she is wrapping up her molting. That's why you can see some of the feathers around. And you can actually keep her feathers. If it was a great horned owl, I'd have to have them back. But because she's an exotic bird of prey, we're exempt of federal regulation. Now, what you got to also think is she's wrapping up her molting. I'm also theorizing she is making a clutch of eggs inside of her body right now. So during this part of the cycle, every female and husband following me here, this is a very hangry female. You did not bring students for her to learn from her today. You all brought food. With these feet here, she can kill up to a 50-pound animal. She'll land on your head, crushing your skull, eat the tasty things off of you, and leave the rest for scavengers. Not as much as the librarians want me to fly around, don't look at the kid you want her to eat, you already did. We can't do that, to be really bad. Now, she only weighs eight pounds, has a six-foot wingspan, 500 pounds of pressure with those talons. She doesn't have a very large sense of smell. She's not very bright. Owls aren't terribly intelligent. They don't have to be. They're very good at one thing, and that one thing is killing. One of the common questions I always get is, how big of a prey can she kill and fly away with? She doesn't. At nighttime, she'll kill whatever she wants and sit there and eat it because everybody else in the wild is afraid of her at nighttime. Now, we use L in programs like this. We also use her in what is called abatement. Abatement is when you use a bird of prey to deter her. Think of an orchard, a vineyard, a landfill, a golf course, a warehouse, an airport. You can have noxious birds coming in, eating the grapes off of the vine. You can have birds in a warehouse pooping in boxes. I talk about a lot of poop. Now, you can have noisemakers and spray chemicals. Those will eventually become null and void. But if you have a falconer like me, and I come and I bring a bird like that, I fly her around, she chases everything else away by her presence. If you work for a winery, you barter services for products so then you don't have to pay taxes. That's called aggressive accounting, and again, I married my attorney. Now, friends, here's the important part of the program for you. Raise your hand if you know what a question is. Raise your hand if you know what a story is. Good, hands down. If you have a question about me or one of my animals, now is the time you get to ask. If you have a story to tell me about your Uncle Jim and the mountain lion, he says he saw it during deer season. We're not talking about that. I hate Facebook fiction. We do not have a sustaining breeding population mountain lion anywhere here in this part of North America. I do have a caveat. I do not talk about Sasquatches anymore. I was at the Mont Eagle, Tennessee Public Library first week in June, and a very nice elderly gentleman from the library took 15 minutes of my time telling me about the encounter he had with the Tennessee pygmy Sasquatch. <laughs> Parents, I believe there was meth involved in that story, so we're not going to go into that. When we deal with the public library, we get all the public, don't we? So intelligent educational questions. Go! This and alert, girls. What's your question, son? The, the raccoon will eat eggs. They love to eat eggs. Yes, son? 
Why does the bat twitch his ears and stick his tongue out? Just like a dog, he cleans his nose so he can have a good sense of smell, and he's always listening for his other bats. One nice thing that has happened with COVID, Billy here became bona fide. We actually had our own first captively bred bat in our collection. Now, I don't normally go for gender fluid, but I can't tell if it is a boy or girl right now, so we just call it Rowan. But I think it's going to be a boy. We can't tell if it's sexual maturity. My baby sister's name Rowan. Is that a question or a story, baby? I'm just saying that. Okay. Did you have a question, hon? Okay. Anybody else? Pirates? Librarians? Questions, comments, smart remarks? Friends, I hope you've enjoyed our library program today. Please feel free to take out some books and check them. Because remember, if you have any more questions, check out a book. If you can't find a book, ask the squidgy head. You're going to have to wear a squidgy head. Now, parents, if you enjoyed this, make sure you continue to support our public library that make it possible for someone like me to come. For the quirky adults in the room that have a good sense of humor, if you're a Facebooker, fan and follow the company. That'll tell you when we're doing public programming in your area, and keep your eyes out for what we call the adult themed programs. Sounds worse than what it really is, that just rolls off the tongue easier. But in this fall, when things cool off, we're going to reinstitute our wildlife and wine series. We work with a number of the wineries in this part of the state, as well as Tennessee State Parks. Basically, you walk into the room, you get a glass of wine, I get an animal out, and I talk about it. When I get a new animal, you get a new glass of wine. Best thing about the entire evening, not so many bloody children. And I know what you're thinking. It's five to seven different exhibits. You'll feel fine by the end of the night. You'll be holding a big albino Burmese python like Brittany. I can feel that. You'll be fine. <laughs> Friends, you've done good. Thank you for coming. Give yourselves one big round of applause. <laughs> we had good numbers. I think we, did we get a good head count? Where are we at? Yeah, I think we beat the Columbia branch. So thank you all for coming. <laughs> I need to turn the air on my car, but if you do need to use the restrooms, they're back here. Do not stick your fingers in any of my cages. I'm not responsible for who eats what. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Have a good rest of your weekend, friends. See you later. Bye-bye.